Maybe not. <laughs> no? Somebody know how to... <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> but the clicker doesn't work, is it? Oh, okay. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, thanks for the introduction, Neil. Um, so while the previous talk was more about improving actual lattice reduction, what we are targeting more is um, the analysis of lattice reduction. So more like getting more into like how, how can we predict what an adversary can get out of lattice reduction. And <clears throat> before stating our results, I want to take a uh, step back and uh, say a few words about what we actually require from algorithms um, for cryptanalysis. In, in, in this case, in particular for, for lattice algorithms. Um, and I would argue there's a, um, essentially three requirements. One is obviously you want the reduction algorithms to be practically performant. Uh, this allows us to play around with them in smaller to moderate dimension and see how they behave. Uh, we also want them to be asymptotically performant because that um, makes sure that nothing weird happens in larger dimensions where we're not quite sure uh, where we can't run the algorithm anymore. Um, but these two requirements are pretty standard for any algorithm, essentially. But there's a unique requirement we have in cryptanalysis, which is saying that we want as, um, an average case prediction, which is as simple as possible. So that somebody who's designing a crypto system uh, can apply it easily and um, uh, yeah, can sort of figure out uh, what an how long an adversary needs to run an algorithm in order to break his crypto system. And one might think that the first two actually imply the last one, but this is unfortunately not true. But you can use uh, the first two properties of an algorithm to guide you through uh, to an average case prediction. So let's see what we've got in current algorithms. Well, we obviously have BKZ. The last talk was about BKZ. Um, and BKZ is widely deployed and used a lot mostly because of its practical performance. It performs really well in practice. Um, you run it and yeah, it's, it's really nice. <clears throat> On the other hand, it's, uh, asymptotic performance is actually pretty good, too. So by now, there has been a lot of work in it in the last few years. Um, and <clears throat> we know we can do a little better in the asymptotic worst case. Um, but it's roughly in the same ballpark. So that is not too much of an issue. <clears throat> However, its average case prediction is still, it's still quite notorious. It's, um, the state of the art right now is to uh, run the simulator <coughs> where you generate uh, some, some typical input to it, then you run the simulator, and then you look what comes out. The simulator is uh, based on some really well-founded heuristics, but also on some heuristics which is not quite clear if these actually hold. And it is uh, quite inconvenient to run for or to apply for, um, <coughs> for crypto analysis or for somebody who just wants to set the parameters of this crypto system. Um, and so we are trying to improve on the situation. What else do we have? We have, on the other hand, we have the slide reduction algorithm that is not as uh, widely known as BKZ and not as widely used. And that is mostly because its practical performance is believed to be um, quite bad. Um, on the other hand, its asymptotic perform performance is as good as it gets at this point uh, for lattice reduction. So it is asymptotically um, the best algorithm we have. <coughs> and also, um, it's um, its asymptotic uh, analysis is actually really clean. It's a clean analysis. It's a nice uh, generalization of the LLL analysis. And out of this clean analysis, actually, also a very simple average case prediction falls just out of the bottom. So <coughs> unfortunately, though, uh, yeah, it is not used a lot because its practical performance is not very good. Um, and so the natural question for us was, obviously, can we get the best of both worlds? Um, and our answer is a self, the self-dual version of the BKZ algorithm. Um, we want the, uh, our version of the algorithm to be performant as well, or just as performant as BKZ. So uh, we model it after the BKZ algorithm. And um, using experimental evaluation, we can show that it is uh, just as performant as, uh, or comparable to BKZ. Um, but then we sort of like try to sidestep the issues that uh, BKZ has with its asymptotic uh, analysis and its uh, average case prediction. 
And so <clears throat> using these side steps and using maybe like borrowing a little bit of the techniques from slide reduction, um, we actually get an algorithm that is asymptotically just as good as slide reduction. And we have a very simple average case uh, prediction, meaning that an adversary can just, um, um, and cryptanalyst can just uh, use a closed formula to predict what comes out of this algorithm. So um, you don't have to run a simulator anymore. Um, you can just um, yeah, ask for a block size, and we can say what roughly was going to come out of it. <coughs> so why do I say that? Um, why do I say that slide reduction behaves so badly? Uh, well, it's only based on one experimental study that has been done so far that included slide reduction, and that is one by Gamma and Gwen in 2008, who actually also designed slide reduction. Um, and here it shows, so on the x-axis you see the block size uh, parameter of the uh, reduction algorithm, which is sort of like a measure of the time spent on it, so of the runtime. Um, and here you see a normalized measure of the um, of the shortest vector found by the algorithm. And so the lower the better. And as you can see, BKZ clearly outperforms slide reduction um, in, this, uh, in their experiment. And that is why no one has used slide reduction so uh, since then anymore. And it is sort of like it was more considered as a theoretical algorithm. But since uh, we were able, uh, so we borrowed techniques from slide reduction, and we also had to implement our algorithm. And then we had all the tools ready to also implement slide reduction relatively easily. So we included it in our experimental study. And for the experimental study, uh, here's what we found. The x-axis is the same again, block size, a measure of the runtime of the algorithm. Uh, horizontal uh, or vertical uh, axis is a uh, room Hermite factor, again, the normalized measure of the shortest vector found. And yes, um, in rather small block sizes, up to around 50, which was the limit of the previous study, as I just showed you. Um, so BKZ and dual BKZ clearly outperform slide reduction. But as you increase the block size, actually, uh, slide reduction becomes quite competitive as well. Um, and as our study shows, our dual BKZ algorithm um, performs comparable to, to BKZ. <coughs> so that's, on the, that's our result on the um, experimental side. We also have a, another technical contribution that should be of, uh, or we hope to be of uh, independent interest. Um, for this, uh, oh, yeah, one more thing. Uh, all our code and data is available online, so if you want to run your own analysis on the data or want to add more uh, experiments or you want to play around with the code, please feel free. <laughs> so and then as, a, as a third contribution, uh, recall that what BKZ does over and over, it looks at, subject, uh, at projected sublattices of, um, of, the, of the lattice or of the lattice basis. And it applies this one operation over and over, right? It applies this, this SVP reduction where we take the first, uh, the first vector of a lattice basis and we make it as short as possible. And because the sum over these is a, is a lattice invariant, all the other ones get, get larger. And so this is how this mass is shift, shifted from the left to the right and it tries to make this, this shape of, um, of, a, of a basis as horizontal as possible um, by just uh, running this over and over. I'll go a bit more into detail later. But for now, uh, we actually have another tool in the toolbox for lattice reduction. Um, and that is, you, uh, that is known as dual SVP reduction. And what you do there, instead of uh, minimizing the first vector in this, in this shape, what you do is you try to maximize the last one. Um, it is not quite obvious how to do that. But what you do is you transition uh, into, the, into the dual. Well, yeah, a few words. Uh, yeah, this, um, if you maximize the last one, again, the sum is a lattice constant stays the same, and so the other ones get shorter, and again, you're moving mass to the, to the right, and you're trying to get this, this whole thing more horizontal. <coughs> and how you, how you achieve that is you transition to the dual um, of, of a lattice, and you compute the shortest vector there, and you insert it in the dual, and then you go back to the primal. Um, but unfortunately, computing the dual of a, of a lattice basis is actually, um, it's asymptotically dominated by the SVP oracle step, but in practice, it, is, it involves matrix inversion, so it involves a factor of at least n to the 3, which um, yeah, is kind of annoying, which is also maybe a, a reason why slide reduction wasn't implemented before. It uses dual SVP reduction. <coughs> but what we come up with is an algorithm that actually allows you to uh, com compute this reduction of a, of a basis without ever computing the dual of a basis. You never have to do this, uh, uh, this dual step and, or this, uh, this dual computation 
<coughs> and uh, dual enumeration, so you're implicitly running an enumeration in the dual without ever computing the dual. And if you look at the algorithm, I don't want you to understand this right now. I just want to show you this is a uh, this is a dual enumeration. This is a prime enumeration, as you would uh, like, yeah, as you would implement it. And they are structurally just really, really similar. This is all I want to show with this with this picture. Is you have a few times you you, know, you run this loop in a different order. Um, you have sometimes you have a minus where you have a plus here. You divide here where you multiply here. But essentially, structurally, they are both the, sim the same. And it turns out they are also, as you would expect from such uh, algorithms, they are also just as uh, efficient. So the uh, this is the rate of enumeration in several dimensions. Um, so the higher the better, but the rate of enumeration, this is in times 10 to the 7 nodes per second, um, it's essentially the same in the dual and the primal. Um, and also adding this to, like if you have an implementation of, an, of a primal enumeration, adding a dual enumeration is actually not very hard because you can just uh, adapt your implementation really easily. And that's what we did in order to imp uh, implement it. We added it to FPLLL. And this part is actually now part of the main branch of FPLLL. We are also working on it to get, it, uh, get our reduction algorithms included, but this is already part of it. If you want to play with one, uh, feel free. All right. Um, this is our results. Now I'm going to start going a little bit more into, uh, into the details and first cover some preliminary that Yoshinori didn't cover. Um, for once, we are going to have to talk about the dual lattice a little bit. Uh, the dual lattice is defined by all the set of, uh, of vectors in the span of the lattice such that uh, the scalar products with any lattice vector is uh, integer. Um, and there's also a notion of a, of a dual basis. So this first one is, um, is, a, is a relationship between lattices. Now we also have a relationship between bases. So as you know, a lattice can have infinitely many bases. But for any basis, if you uh, compute the, the basis D, such that they have the same span, and they're sort of like uh, the inverse of each other in some sense, um, this means that D actually generates a dual of B. So they're actually generating dual lattices. And uh, we also know something about their, uh, the relationship between the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalizations. We call the BI stars as a, uh, the orthogonalized vectors, the length of the orthogonalized vectors. And their relationship to the duals is also given by, uh, by this formula. So their length is 1 over the length of DI star or star DI. Uh, to the minus one. Why do I write star di? Well, it turns out the right way to look at uh, the orthogonalization of the dual is to um, orthogonalize it from right to left rather from, than from left to right. So you start from the last, last vector, you orthogonalize everything before that, um, and then you just uh, keep going. And then if you do it that way, then uh, the GSOs are nicely related as well. And in particular, we have that B and star, if you substitute an i for uh, n for i, then b n star is just the length of the um, last vector in the, in the dual basis. And because we are orthogonalizing the dual basis from the right to left, this is just a, um, this is just a dual vector, no orthogonalization whatsoever. And so in order to maximize this, we minimize this dn. And so this is where this uh, going into the dual comes from. And SVP reducing the dual, this allows you to maximize the b n star. This is where this comes from. Um, and so a couple of more things we need. We're almost done with the preliminaries, uh, but we need a few more equations. And um, in particular, we want to uh, talk about some bounds that we have on SCP that, has, that are useful in the analysis. Um, obviously, we have uh, Minkowski's bound, which tells us that for any lattice, um, the shortest vector lambda 1 is the first minimum. It's the, short, it's the length of the shortest uh, non-zero vector in the lattice. Uh, and this is always smaller than O of square root n times the root determinant of the lattice. Um, and that is independent of the basis, by the way. That's also interesting. But um, uh, if you take, if you replace this uh, lambda 1 with the, actual, with the actual vector that you have in the, in the first, uh, yeah, the first vector you have in the GSO after you SVP reduce uh, your basis, and you take the log of this equation, this is the equation that you get out of it. Uh, also, the determinant is just, um, it's just, or the log of the determinant is just a sum over the shape of the basis, so the log of the other bi stars. Um, so you get this, if you take the log of this equation, you get this affine inequality that you can um, exploit, as we'll later see in um, 
where we're going to model these these log pi stars as um, as variables. And so the output, or like yeah, this output variable is going to be in a fine combination of input variables. Furthermore, we have the Gaussian heuristic, which looks very similar. It actually, in this notation, it pretty much looks the same. The Gaussian heuristic says, well, for random lattices, so there's like there's a notion of random lattices where you can prove this heuristic actually rigorously true, um, but in this case, uh, uh, the first minimum is actually quite close to um, order of square root n times the deter root determinant of the lattice. Um, but for constants that we actually, like we can compute these constants, and so we actually get uh, some, something that's somewhat stronger because we get a rough uh, equality here rather than an inequality, and we can do the same trick where we take the log, and we get, an, um, uh, yeah, we get a rough equality again in a fine one. However, I put a star there for a reason, and it has been shown that there's a caveat with their previous experimental studies uh, showed that in the context of block reduction, um, this, uh, this Gaussian heuristic is only accurate if you increase a block size large enough or for large enough blocks. So only when the block size grows uh, beyond 50 or something, uh, that's when the Gaussian heuristic becomes uh, accurate. Below that, it's actually horribly inaccurate. And that is actually where a lot of the problems for BKZ stem from. So as we will see now, uh, let's have a brief look again at, at BKZ. BKZ, um, as I mentioned before, it takes this, this SVP um, operation where it tries to minimize the first vector, and it applies this uh, to, the first, to the first block of the basis, for the, to the first sub lattice. Uh, the block size parameter is better. Um, and it then just keeps doing that all the way to the left until uh, it reaches the end. And when it reaches the end, we are kind of stuck, right? The, the window is at the, at the right. We can't move any further. But what BKZ does is it just simply makes the block smaller and smaller. And so at some point, um, yeah, so and when, we are, when we are done, when the block size has a size one, well, then the problem is solved trivially. And then we start over. This was a tour of BKZ, as uh, Yoshinori already, already mentioned. Um, and uh, BKZ just does it over and over again. And so how would you analyze this? Well, the state of the art analysis um, looks again at, uh, well, what happens, what happens in this step? Well, <clears throat> let's say we, we model all these, these bars. These are our log bi stars. Let's model these as uh, variables. And let's say we know what's, what's coming into the algorithm. Um, then using Minkowski's, uh, Minkowski's the theorem, so this, this inequality here, we can, we can write the output uh, as in a fine equation of, uh, of the input. And in the next step, we can do the same thing again, and we do that over and over again. And what you can do, is, or what you can show, is that you can set up this, um, this dynamical system, um, and then <coughs> you get for, a, if you have upper bounds for the input, then you get an upper bound for the output if you apply this dynamical system once. And now you can use the techniques from the dy dynamical system analysis um, and prove um, um, and look at the convergence of the system at, at the fixed point. The fixed point is going to give you uh, an upper bound on what comes out of this algorithm, and the convergence is going to give you an upper bound on the runtime. Uh, and this was done by Aron, Xoyola, and Stiele. That was a very nice paper that was applied to BKZ. And now the hope is that if you replace the Minkowski's bound by the Gaussian heuristic, that you would get a very easy um, average case analysis out of it. But unfortunately, this is not true, because remember, we have these, uh, smaller, these smaller blocks in the end. And here, the Gaussian heuristic doesn't hold. And so unfortunately, you, just can't, you can't just take the, the analysis in this paper, translate it into, a, um, and translate it into an uh, average case heuristic analysis. But this is essentially what the BKZ simulator does, by the way. Um, it is trying to do that. And in the end, it has to resort to some uh, sort of unproven um, assumptions about what the shape of, of the tail is going to look like. And this is where a lot of the problems for BKZ come from in the average case prediction. And this is why you need a simulator and can't just use math and a closed formula. And so how does, this, uh, how does it differ to, to self-dual BKZ? <coughs> well, we said we want to retain, um, okay, retain its practical performance. And so what we do, we just start out the same way as BKZ does. We take the first block. We um, SVP reduces and we shift to the right. But once we get to the end, 
we have this last block, and there's uh, what we can see made smaller and smaller block sizes and reduced them, and that's where all the trouble comes from. We say, well, we don't do that. Instead, in the end, we apply a dual SVP reduction. We leave the block size that it is, but we apply the dual SVP reduction, and now we just move the, uh, this doesn't work. Right. We just move the block in the other direction back. And then once we get to the other side again, um, we'll start doing SVP reduction again. And so you have this window of size uh, better that just moves back and forth on this basis. Um, and <coughs> um, we mainly do that because we want to get rid of this small tail uh, or of this tail of BKZ. And you might think, well, now this looks more complicated than BKZ, so the analysis uh, might be more complicated. But as it turns out, <coughs> you can view this as also doing one tour all the time. Just you do a BKZ tour, and then <coughs> instead of doing another one, what you do first is you uh, compute the dual of the basis, compute its rever rever reverse all the variables, uh, and then you start over. So what you're doing is you're running BKZ, go into the dual, reverse the basis, and start over to BKZ again, reverse, compute the dual, etc. <coughs> and so this actually is uh, a much simpler system than uh, what the BKZ system looks like. Um, and because we don't have uh, smaller blocks, we can actually simply plug in the Gaussian heuristic and, um, and get an average case analysis out of this for free, essentially. And <coughs> one more thing that's very interesting about this is um, it came up in the previous talk that often about lattice reduction, there's an additional assumption being made that the output of um, lattice reduction follows a straight line, which is known as the uh, Gram-Schmidt, uh, no, the geometric series assumption, sorry. So Schnorr's GSA says that um, the output like this would actually look like a straight line at the end of a lattice reduction, or roughly like a straight line. Well, if you look at the fixed point of, um, of our system and <coughs> Um, it actually proves that this is true for under the Gaussian heuristic. So for our algorithm, actually, the Gaussian heuristic implies the GSA um, modulus the little window at the end. So for all the other um, for all the other vectors, <coughs> the GSA actually holds true if the, the Gaussian heuristic is true. And so this is this is not known. This was not known about uh, BKZ, and it's still not known about BKZ. But for uh, self-dual BKZ, we don't have to do an additional assumption. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about the dual enumeration, but uh, I'm out of time, and I refer you to the paper for that. Thank you very much. <coughs> Any questions? Uh, hi. Thank you for the talk. Uh, just a quick question. When you compared uh, the performance of BKZ to dual BKZ, was it the full BKZ or the truncated one? Uh, it was truncated. Okay. So yeah, we went up to block size 80. At, like, at some point, you can't uh, run it. Uh, it's a full BKZ. You have to do an early termination. That was the question, right? Yeah. And so that's what we did. But that's also what we did for dual BKZ. So the, the terminating condition in, in the self-dual BKZ is also a little tricky because you're always changing the basis because you're always uh, computing the dual. And so uh, you have to be a little bit careful with that. But um, yeah, and I mean, like the, the dynamic of the systems uh, analysis shows that um, after a few rounds, you don't have to run it anymore. You, you can terminate and you're okay. done. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>